Can you put a put a yes? Oh, great. Oh, good, good, good. So um, we're here from you.com. I'm here to talk to you about transformers at scale, open challenges and search. I'm Sam Bean, I'm a staff engineer, um, working on infrastructure, um, machine learning, other stuff. I'm Sahil. I'm an engineering manager here at u.com. I'm working on building search and ranking systems. Cool. Um, so today, we're going to talk about transformers at u.com, how we use them. We're going to talk about a technology combination of Hugging Face and Apache Spark. We're going to talk about doing really, really big batches of uh, vectors um, and embeddings with uh, pandas UDFs. We're going to talk about uh, neural network optimizations to increase forward pass throughput. We're going to talk about uh, running some of this stuff on Spark again, some tips, tricks, um, some future things we're looking at. And then we're going to talk about um, sort of what we apply a lot of this tech to in, in the form of search. So I think the, the first half of the talk is going to be about how we do very, very large scale NLP. And then uh, the second half of the talk is going to be what we do with these large scale NLP systems. Um, so really quickly about you.com. Uh, we're a search engine company. We, um, we crawl the web. We build machine learning models to retrieve and rank data. Um, we have a number of new features, which we didn't add here, um, which is what we call conversational search, which is a generative AI search experience um, that we went to market with in December for everyone else. And we have a number of personalization systems. We also take privacy very seriously. So we have the best in class uh, kind of zero telemetry, zero log, um, no trace private mode. Um, and we try to balance a lot of the personalization uh, machine learning capabilities with um, a very serious security and privacy posture. So uh, Sal's going to talk really quickly about some of the apps that we build um, and how we partition search data and run retrieval in our search service. Hey, so thanks, Sam. Um, essentially, we take a pretty different approach to search, where we're essentially solving for various information retrieval problems in different domains, corresponding to what we call apps. We power our own search across these domains, and we also partner with other companies as well which is reflected by our diverse set of apps spanning categories like programming sites to public forums. Um, so you can see apps in some of the categories listed here. So for example, within the programming category, we've built a variety of apps to power you code, our search engine for developers with an emphasis on programming sites like Stack Overflow. We also have a variety of other categories and associated apps like shopping apps, research apps, log forum apps from Medium to Reddit. And we also have various um, open platform apps. Um, so this is basically the idea where you know anybody can really build an app and we can integrate it into our search engine and into our conversational search um, because we also have been focusing a lot on conversational search with the introduction of UChat, which also has kind of rich modality even beyond text in its output. Wow, that sounds great. Um, people should use the site more. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how we use transformers now. Um, so kind of because of when the company was founded, we sort of had the luxury to basically build all of our search systems from the ground up with transformers in mind. So pretty much the entire company has a very, very strong transformer neural network background uh, or backbone. And so this kind of spans across every machine learning task that we do. So things like semantic search, uh, basically running uh, vector databases that we perform retrieval tasks on, a number of classification tasks like uh, user intent detection, um, causal language modeling or generative AI, as some people call it. We have a number of apps that kind of generate text based on user input. And we also have some, this includes now UChat, which has a kind of a mixture of 
uh, generative with uh, some retrieval augmentation built into it. And then um, we have ranking tasks, which we have use like deep neural networks and transfer learning to accomplish. Um, and so pretty much everything we do, we have, we are either using large language models or transformers of some sort uh, to solve our problems. And so here's like one example of um, some of our generative AI apps. So these are what we call the, um, the code gen apps. So we have a, a large language model, which you can give um, request to for specific types of, of text output. And you will get kind of domain specific generations per um, what you're looking for. And then we, because we're a search engine, we surface these depending on your, your request. And so if you have questions about Spark syntax or Kubernetes commands or how to work, write certain regexes, we have the ability to tailor some of our generative AI apps to, to the domain and to the search request. Um, but today we're going to spend most of our time talking about semantic search. Uh, and so to start out, we're going to start with like the 10,000 foot view. Uh, most people who have some sort of semantic search architecture probably have um, some system that looks like this, where on one end of the system, we have the World Wide Web, uh, which we have an, uh, distributed crawling systems, which go out, get that data from the internet, uh, dump it to some sort of uh, data lake, we use Delta. Um, which allows us to kind of partition all of our data and have very, very fast retrieval across it. And we don't really need uh, data warehousing tech. And then we have a suite or of, of ETLs, which some of them have kind of hugging face enrichment steps in them where we run uh, pre-processing, uh, parsing ETL uh, on top of our, our raw data lake. And we use that to basically index into a, a database. Uh, we put vectors into it sometimes. We have, I mean, um, this is not kind of representative of every way we do search at u.com. It is sort of a, we have a lot of systems that are at play to kind of bring you the, the experience that you see on the website. Um, but as far as the, the vector search goes, we have a large database of um, semantic vectors that we index. And then on the other side of that, we have people who make queries and we push those queries through a hugging face transformer model. And then we calculate query document um, similarities. And then we use that to find documents that are related to your queries. And so uh, this is what our, our setup looks like. Uh, other people might have different tools in place, but I think that most people who are running production systems like this are going to end up with some sort of setup that resembles what you see here. Um, and so most of what I'm going to be talking to you about is, uh, let's see if I can go backwards, previous, there we go. So most of what we're going to be talking about is this little box at the bottom left, this ETL box. So how do we get from our raw data and get embeddings out of it and put those into a database. How do we do that at like a really, really big scale? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so first we're going to talk about some of the technology choices. So Apache Spark, people are familiar with, um, very fault tolerant ETL system, big data system, whatever you want to call it. Um, checkpointing logic for people who write these uh, indexing jobs or inference jobs. Um, to run machine learning models at across a lot of data, know that checkpointing logic can be kind of tricky. Spark does it for you, which is great. Uh, it's also massively parallel, so we can process through tons of data and scale out our Spark fleet to basically go across arbitrarily large amounts of data. Um, and that allows us to process through the, the data kind of a, in a timely manner so that we constantly have the freshest data on the site. Um, and then on, with, with Spark, we run a number of Hugging Face models. Uh, Hugging Face is very, very easy to use. Um, pretty much the lowest barrier of entry to running transformer models in the industry today. Um, 
very efficient tokenization library that's written in Rust and a lot of kind of auxiliary libraries that come with it, like the Optimum library. I think there's some other ones that um, allow you to optimize your neural networks to be hardware specific so you can maximize your throughput. Um, and so together, we kind of use, we use these tools together and to get really specific when we're running these super uh, large parallel jobs that have hugging face in them, we are usually using uh, a newer feature of Apache Spark, which is the pandas UDF. And so the way that Spark works is it takes your, your data, which is a big, big blob of data, and then it kind of breaks it down into these, these logical units known as partitions. And then it applies the transforms in uh, each step of the transformation that you want to apply to each partition. And these are known as a task. So each stage of a job applied to a single partition is a task. Each task that finishes is checkpointed. And that's sort of like the, uh, that's the uh, like most atomic unit of, of retries that Spark has. It will retry tasks. And if enough tasks fail, the job will fail. And um, this gives you a large number of fault tolerance because um, instead of the whole job failing because you crash partway through your input data, only a single partition will fail, which is much easier to retry. Um, and so this is sort of what your standard Apache Spark jobs look like. Um, when you add in these new Pandas UDFs, there's actually another layer of indirection here, um, which uses Apache Arrow. And so each partition within the job is itself turned into a batch. So we have these like batches of batches where each partition is operated on by a task. And that task is made up of these Pandas UDFs, which is a UDF as a user defined function. And Apache Arrow allows you to, is like a very fast transfer layer for data. And it lets you take each partition, turn it into batches, and then push those batches through the UDF as one logical unit. Now, the, the big upside here when you're using a library like Hugging Face is that um, if you're in the previous slide, you're running your UDF still row by row. And because these are neural networks, they like things in batches. And so if you're if you have to push, do a forward pass for each row in your data frame, then you're gonna end up with like really suboptimal performance. So what we get here is we we get a lot of the um native support for Spark, but we also have some method for pushing large batches through the transformer all at one time. And so this is like another layer of parallelism that we get. Um, by using these pandas UDFs. And so if we have six workers here, each of them are running a partition, and then each of those partitions are operating in batches where so you have like six by n um, parallelism at one time, where six can be scaled out again almost infinitely. And we kind of take the output of these pandas UDFs, which in our case is like a, a vector or an embedding. We sort of put that into our data frame, which we can pass downstream to um, some of the databases that we use to, to serve user requests. And so this is kind of the mechanism by which we, we do really, really large scale ETLs that involve um, sophisticated neural network models that we get from Hugging Face. And next we'll take a look at like, these spark jobs because they are um they are very very compute intensive and very very memory intensive because you have lots of these vectors in in memory possibly at one time um there's a tool called ganglia if you're doing this yourself um i would highly suggest you use the, your monitoring tools um the things that i'm outlining are probably not going to work out of the box, it's going to take a little bit of, of tuning and human intervention to figure out what the, the, the right amount of, of parallelism you can push through the system at one time. Uh, so this is a, a picture of a pretty unhappy amount of, of parallelism. You can see like CPU in the bottom left is super spiky. It's not very consistent. And in the top right, we're, we're moving into swap memory pretty frequently. 
uh, which means that there's a lot of memory movement being around, which probably means that you're doing lots of spark shuffles. Uh, on the other hand, this is much happier. Memory is very, is all, is you're not swapping. Everything is pretty steady. Um, the CPU in the most ideal world would be pinned at 100%. Um, but this is much more of the the type of, of um, uh, compute and memory profile that you're looking for on your Spark cluster. Uh, and so this is all great. We can do lots of we can do lots of batches, but if you want to go faster, if you have a need for speed, um, there are ways to kind of push the envelope even further. Uh, once you have this parallelism, you can get more throughput of through the system by either increasing the number of physical machines via hardware to increase your parallelism, or you can increase the throughput of each individual parallel process. Um, and to do that usually means making your forward passes faster. And we do that at u.com via this little thing called the Onyx Runtime or the Open Neural Network Exchange, unified format for neural nets. Um, ORT is a kind of runtime that stands on top of Onyx. And it allows you to basically do very hardware specific inference to get more throughput than you would just running like a PyTorch model, for example. Um, and you can use these Onyx runtimes with the Hugging Face Pipelines API using Optimum to kind of seamlessly switch out either a PyTorch Hugging Face model or an Onyx runtime Hugging Face model. Um, and you can get even more performance out of it if you run further optimizations, which kind of come with, with Onyx runtime, like neural net quantization or graph optimizations, like folding, um, that sort of thing. And uh, But you have to do these on the machines that you're running them on because um, Onyx needs to know something about the, 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 the physical hardware that it's running on to best optimize your, your nets. And so this sounds like free lunch, which is great. But if you're running in the Spark setting, it ends up not being free lunch. Um, the sort of setup that we outlined before uh, leverages Pickle by default, and certain objects within the Onyx runtime cannot be pickled, which means that you cannot distribute these objects, these imprint sessions, down to your workers to, um, to actually operate on the data. But because we're very clever, we have ways around that. We have, um, well, this is, the, this is the problem that we have. We have PySpark using pickling to transmit UDF code, or pandas UDF code to workers. And you have Onyx runtime inference sessions not being able to be pickled. And so basically you have to make sure that you aren't transmitting UDFs with Onyx runtime inference sessions inside of them. And what this usually, the, the way that we got around this is uh, this, this file broadcast system. And so what this does is um, we kind of, the Spark fleet is made up of a driver and a number of worker nodes where the driver is sort of the orchestration agent and the workers are what actually process the data. So what we do is we get our hugging face model, convert it to Onyx, we run our quantizations or, or graph optimizations on it, which outputs our optimized neural network file. And then what we do is instead of sending the code that references the Onyx inference session, what you can do instead is you can broadcast that file raw to all of the worker nodes. And so the workers can actually kind of load that from wherever they have it locally. And therefore, this step in the middle um, where you have data flowing from, you have, if you have instructions flowing from your driver to your workers, that's pickled. So you can't send your Onyx runtime session that way. You can send the raw, raw file and you can distribute it across all of your workers. And you can have the workers basically reference their local copy of this. Um, when they instantiate the, the data structures that they need to run the, 
the code that's transmitted from driver to worker. Um, so you can use what's called the add file API um, within Spark to accomplish this. And to make it all super concrete, um, it sort of looks like this. So if you have a uh, Distilbert model, you can load up some of this ORT model for feature extraction for pulling embeddings out. Um, you can create a quantizer out of that. You can create a, your quantization config. You could also make an optimization config. Here we're using ARM64 because that's what the hardware is that we're running our, our Spark cluster on. Quantize the model. You save that, that artifact locally on the driver node. Broadcast the file. You need the, conf the tokenization config as well as the quantized Onyx or optimized Onyx file. Um, and then your execution, instead of referencing a, a Onyx runtime session that exists outside of your UDF, you actually load it directly in line. And um, by doing this, you avoid the, the transmission of, of this object, which can't be pickled, which, which breaks things. And this all works. And then you get um, some amount of, of, of throughput increase. It changes from case to case. Obviously, in this setting, you are paying an IO penalty because you're actually reading a file from, from the, the disk that's on the machine. And so what you have to ensure is that whatever throughput increase you get is, is more than that IO penalty. And so you do that by making your pandas batches very, very large so that um, you are loading the file less and you are also have a much more compute intensive forward pass uh, when you run when you run these uh, this, this transformer model on it. Um, and you but you can get a lot more a lot more juice out of the system this way. And so kind of an overview, hugging face, super great, easy to use, state of the art. Um, has libraries for optimizing your your models to make them even faster. Apache Spark, also super great. You can do lots of big batches of data. You can use Pandas UDFs to take your data and turn them into batches so that they're more properly suited to push them through neural networks. Tons of options for configuring your, your Spark jobs to maximize the parallelism. Make sure that you're, you're running your machines as hot as possible. Um, and then if you need more throughput, then you can incur some complexity in the system by in introducing Onyx and the Onyx runtime and some sort of quantization or optimization scheme to increase the throughput of your pandas batches. Uh, but to do that, you need a way to broadcast the data instead of trying to pickle the Onyx runtime inference session. Some tips, use small models. Uh, I, if you're doing something like this, I wouldn't start with a big model. Uh, it's going to be harder to tune, and it's going to give you more headaches up front. Um, so try to make the small models work better. Deberta V3 Extra Small is a very, very small model, I think like 20 million parameters, um, and still very competitive with the models that are much larger and the hundreds of millions of parameters. Um, and then you have a number of Tuning options, your, the number of partitions that you have, the max records that you put in your pandas batches. There's monitoring tools to help you tune these jobs. There's lots of different um, Onyx neural network optimizations. Um, and so there's lots of different knobs to tune in this setup. And so depending on the ergonomics of your data and the models that you're using, um, results may vary, right? And in the future, we probably... To go even larger than this, we could look at um, more more optimized uh, uh, file formats for neural networks like TensorRT instead of the uh, Onyx runtime. Uh, TensorRT is even faster. It's developed by NVIDIA. And then there are kind of GPU accelerated Pandas UDFs in, this, in the CUDF library, um, which comes from Rapids, I think. And so the system that I outlined before is all CPU based. Um, you could make it even faster going to all GPU based if you're willing to pay. So that's all for me. Uh, this is how we kind of 
get data into a way that we can do search on it. And now Sahil is going to spend the rest of your the rest of the time kind of talking to you about like all of the problems that happen once you can do search on things. There's the problems don't stop. So Sahil, do you want to take it away? Yeah. And I think actually, Sam, there might be two questions for you and I can read them out to you. Sure. The first question is, do those unhealthy scenarios correspond to failures or just poor performance? I believe this is referring to maybe the ganglia plots. Oh, yeah. So um, you will get poor performance because you you do have, um, you're going to spend more like system time moving memory around. And so your CPU isn't going to be kind of burring as fast as it can. Um, sometimes those can lead to failures. Sometimes the the poor performance can get to a point where um, executor heartbeats and your spark job will fail. And those heartbeats are what tells the driver that like, I'm still alive and I'm still pro here processing data. And enough of those heartbeats fail, the entire job will, will shut down and, and, and fail. And that's also a tunable option is like how many things can die before you, you crash the whole job. Um, and so that's kind of like the trade-off between how how robust do you want the whole system to be, but how much do you want it to try to make progress when maybe it's actually not making progress? So there's a trade-off there. So it can be both. Cool. And then the second question. Yeah. Second question was Onyx translation is just for optimized performance on training slash inference, right? Yeah. So we're using it for inference here. Um you can use it for training. Um you can use ORT for training for sure to get more throughput. All it does is it makes the is it makes the the neural graph uh, more efficient. And so any way that you're doing a forward pass is going to become more efficient. Whether you're doing a forward pass to calculate gradients or you're doing a forward pass to just get the outputs of the network, um, both are going to be faster. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, it's basically. Cool. The general approach, a lot of the stuff Sam talked about, a lot of it applies to um, both the optimization techniques, a lot of them apply to both the training and inference side of things. Um, cool. Um, I'll now talk a little bit about search and information retrieval. So Great. thank you. Um, next, we'll talk about the future of search and then some open challenges as well. But before we get into this, I'm going to quickly go over some search concepts to define a common vocabulary. So using the tools Sam described, we can really build up you know, powerful semantic search systems. Um, but also, you know, as I mentioned, that semantic search is kind of one piece within a broader, e broader ecosystem of approaches to search. And I'll talk a little bit and introduce us to kind of different ideas, uh, many of which are useful if y'all are building, you know, information retrieval systems. Um, so one concept is classical information retrieval. So in classical IR, we're essentially retrieving documents using traditional tools, such as an inverted index. And classical information retrieval is characterized by being keyword based. A lot of them, a lot of it basically deals with, you know, best tokenizing queries and documents, best weighing term document pairs, querying document expansion, and learning to rank based on keyword-based scores, among other concepts. Um, we often leverage TF-IDF scores here, which stands for you know, term frequency, inverse document frequency. Essentially, the idea is that if a term in a query is present in a document, but is also somewhat infrequent across all the documents, it'll have a high TF-IDF score. But in practice, VM25 scores, which are essentially a fancier version of TF-IDF scores that take into account document length, work better. Um, so that said, Neural advances over the last couple of years have introduced a ton of opportunities and questions. So search pipelines often consist of retrieval and re-ranking stages. I'll talk about neural IR in terms of its impact on both retrieval and re-ranking. And when it comes to retrieval, um, we can use neural models to retrieve documents. But in order to be useful, two questions need to be answered. The first one is, can pre-trained language models improve retrieval? And the answer is yes. It can get around a lot of the limitations of classical IR as keyword-based approaches fail to capture semantics. I think we're all aware of a lot of the about like the advances that have happened in NLP. So it shouldn't be unsurprising that you know they can provide value in retrieving documents. But the second question is, can we efficiently use such models over large corpuses? And the answer is also yes. And this is because there's been many advances in approximate nearest neighbor search at scale, which essentially allow for low latency retrieval from dense vector representations. There are a variety of open source initiatives and also companies that can abstract this infra um, on, on your behalf, essentially. So I think right now it's a great time and I think overall, um, folks in the search ecosystem are pretty well positioned to capitalize on a lot of the advances in neural information retrieval. Um, and then one other concept would be on the re-ranking side. So this is the second stage in the retrieval re-ranking architecture. So assuming we retrieved you know, K documents, we basically want to generate a score for each query document and sort the documents on the score. 
um, on one side. So, that, so of note, basically, there's this trade-off between what I would call latency and quality. So on one side, there are you know, very low latency approaches that leverage representation-based similarity methods, such as a bi encoder. Essentially, what that means is that um, you know, we have document embeddings, maybe these are cached or stored on, or stored on the document, and then you embed the query, and then you can do a dot product or a cosine similarity between the two. And it's generally low latency because um, you know, you've done a lot of it beforehand in terms of you know, caching document embeddings. But on the other side, there are higher latency, but generally higher quality approaches that essentially pass the query and document through a transformer together, um, allowing what can be called basically all-to-all -all interaction. Um, so this is kind of where we think a lot about you know, some of those cross-encoder approaches. But in the middle, there's also relatively newer approaches, but and, and a lot of research, um, you know, some of which is known as like late interaction. This was introduced by um, Katab and Zaharia from Stanford in their work on Colbert. Um, but a general idea here is that you generate a relevant score by embedding the query and then caching embeddings for tokens from the last layer of a transformer for documents. So essentially, we we're trying to approximate all to all interaction without passing each token in the document through each layer of a transformer by caching embeddings from the last layer for the document. And there are also many other approaches to represent query document similarity on the spectrum, such as using, for example, convolutional networks, but these are less commonly used now. So this is kind of a very brief, somewhat fast introduction to kind of different you know, concepts within information retrieval. Um, we now go to the next slide. So I'll now talk a little bit about the future of search and some open challenges. So given our experiences building our own search, we've identified the following you know, opportunities and challenges for the NLP and search community. So this is non-exhaustive, but it's generally rooted in the problems that we do face. Um, so I'll talk about you know, some of these topics and we'll start off with talking about some open challenges in semantic search. Next slide. So essentially, you know, our use of semantic search, what Sam talked about earlier, has raised some of the following questions. So one is how do we embed long documents effectively? So there are some models with you know, larger token limits, but many models, like BERT, for example, have five, 12 token limits. So essentially, there's kind of two options here. One is that we represent the document with one vector, either by embedding the most representative text or merging vectors across chunks. Merging vectors can take the form of you know, things like, aver like you know, average pooling, max pooling, concatenating, um, and choosing the most representative text and also include just selecting important fields um, or using you know, approaches like doc to query or summarization models to generate text. So eventually the idea on this first option would be we have a really long document. Um, we basically you know, want to represent it with one vector um, by either choosing some important text within the document or merging a bunch of different chunks. Option two is that we can represent the document with n vectors, um, where n can be the number of sentences or paragraphs or some other what I would call semantic chunk within the document. So option two is obviously gonna be more expensive than option one, which brings us to our next point, which is how do we navigate the trade-off between quality and cost? So anybody building you know, large scale search systems um, will have to kind of think a little bit about this trade-off because um, there's different variables here. So for example, number of vectors can increase you know, the cost of a semantic index. Um, semantic search is generally you know, more expensive, at least right now, compared to a more traditional search, kind of using inverted indices. Um, because of the use of memory, essentially. Um, the size of the vectors will also kind of increase it. So if you're using 768 dimensional vectors, it's going to be you know, more expensive than you know, a half, um, like a, a, you know, a, a size that's kind of half of that. And then also the number of concurrent experiments. So if you're running multiple experiments where you have to keep kind of embedding everything, um, there's actually a cost to experimentation that can actually be non-trivial as well. Um, and then the last kind of you know, open challenge here is what are the best ways to train doc dense document representations? So one question is around, when to fine tune. So, you know, we find that fine tuning is often necessary in certain domains and out of the box approaches won't work on some, but they're not all domains. And another question is, you know, what are the best ways to fine tune? So for example, there's methods of fine tuning the query embedder and keeping the document embedder static to reduce the need to keep kind of re-indexing your entire semantic cluster. Um, and there's also thorny questions around personalization at scale without breaking the bank essentially and incorporating click signals. Um, so that's kind of a small taste of kind of some topics that are, you know, still open with the semantic search. Next slide. The next topic would be kind of the best of um, basically combining classical and neural IR. So getting the best of the lexical and semantical worlds. Um, and generally lexical and semantic search work quite well together as complements. But that said, there are some challenges when blending search results together. So one challenge is how do you unify features from different approaches? So lexical you know, search usually gets signals like the M25 scores, whereas semantic search gets signals like vector similarity scores. This can be you know, cosine similarity or dot product operation output. Um, you know, ideally, you know, one idea could be we retrieve semantic signals 
for lexically retrieved documents and lexical signals for semantically retrieved documents, but then we also add additional latency, so it may or may not be worth it. So there's a lot of other you know things to think about um, when unifying. Another method you know includes heuristic re-ranking approaches. So heuristic re-ranking approaches often work well, but we need to contextualize to the domain and other factors. So for example, we could put the semantic results at the beginning if we have a good enough model, a high threshold, and strong filters on our semantic cluster. We can also put them at the end if we know that keyword hits are relevant and we need to boost recall for more semantic queries. This is often very common in e-commerce. And then we can also mix as well heuristically, taking into account different types of brute features. So for example, the number of the words in the query, et cetera. Um, and there's another question you know, regarding in what domains do you keyword-based approaches thrive? I mean, in what domains do you keep semantic search approaches or semantic approaches thrive? And we do find that performance does differ across domains. Um, and oftentimes users also expect results from keyword-based approaches. So using semantic approaches without taking into account the consideration of user expectations can also decrease the overall experience if it's not used appropriately and thoughtfully. And then lastly, how do we think about different underlying indexing economics? So on a per document basis, as I mentioned before, the costs do dramatically differ in both worlds, at least right now, which leads to questions around what documents should be indexed into a semantic cluster and what documents should be indexed into an inverted index. And semantic search is generally more expensive than lexical search, given the large memory footprint of the clusters and the high price of memory. So it's important to ask, what is the optimal strategy for combining the lexical and semantic worlds from both the relevance perspective and the financial perspective when you know, we're building some of these systems? Um, and the kind of the next topic I'll talk about very briefly is the kind of what I would broadly refer to as learning. So there's a variety of challenges related to learning, which refers to learning embeddings as well as retrieval and re-ranking models. The first question is around you know, how to learn, basically learning to rank. So given what we've chatted about, we could theoretically get both neural signals and classical BM25 type signals from text. And, you know, but documents also have non-textual signals. So for example, number of likes or some notion of popularity. And how do we use LTR approaches um, across various types of signals with low latency? So that's something we think a lot about. Another one is how effective can transfer learning across search domains be? So there's a lot of open source models trained on billions of sentence pair examples. Um, so to what extent do we want to do transfer learning and then fine tune further? And to what extent can we transfer fine tuned models across domains? So for example, a legal domain, how well would that go to a scientific and vice versa? And then lastly is kind of how effective can multitask learning be in IR? So there are various NLP tasks. So for example, there's tasks like, you know, intent detections, you know, what we would call entity extraction or slot filling, as well as retrieval and ranking. And to what extent can we kind of share a base model and learn across tasks? So this is still a very nascent in information retrieval in general. And the next topic our open challenge will be around benchmarking. Um, so essentially, you know, without strong benchmarks, we can't really reliably evaluate different learning approaches we just discussed. So building strong benchmarks to evaluate search methods is pretty tricky, but it's critical to the development of robust search systems. Um, and we can't really go through every document on a corpus for every query to find and rank the best documents. It's just simply you know, too unscalable, especially when you have a very large corpus. So one approach involves manually curating ground truth from automatically generated smaller candidate sets. And the question is, how do you then most efficiently incorporate and leverage humans in the loop? Another approach would be kind of thinking a lot about, you know, weekly supervised approaches to conduct train and test sets. Um, there's a lot of tools now that kind of, you know, think a lot about weak supervision. So that's also an interesting area um, of, you know, burgeoning research. And then lastly, you know, can we take advantage of click signals from users? So how do we effectively use sparse and noisy click signals? Because um, click signals can be useful, but they can also sometimes be very sparse, especially when it comes to information retrieval. And then the last topic I'll touch on is kind of two um, more I guess like two, I guess some of them actually are, I was gonna say future facing, but actually it's kind of more of the current for us as well. Um, but these are important areas where search engines will need to continue to like innovate. And the first one is multimodal search. Um, so search nowadays needs to surface results across modalities um, and embeddings and semantic search can play a pretty useful role here in terms of making it easy to essentially kind of have very good multimodal search. So that's something that maybe is more of a future topic in terms of um, the research, but it is quite interesting. And the last thing I'll kind of talk a little bit about would be generative language models. So as Sam maybe alluded to earlier, um, you know, in December of last year, we launched UChat. So UChat is essentially a conversational AI within the context of search. So the idea is that you can use UChat um, and you can, you know, talk to it. It's essentially a chatbot. But at the same time, you can have, you know, web results and what we call apps, which I described earlier, within the search results as well. And one topic that we think a lot about here is, you know, what are the role that generative models play in search? 
um, given the, and so there's been so many exciting advances in this space. Um, and this is just not, you know, even related to just text generation, but also encompasses image generation with, you know, all these advances that have been made, for example, um, from DALI, stable diffusion, and then onwards. It's been kind of just a, a continuous set of improvements in a lot of this, these generative models. Um, so we think a lot about, you know, how do we do that? But then another topic is how do you track provenance? So one, you know, notion we have or we've added in UChat is citations. So one thing that's very important with generative models is thinking a lot about, you know, how do we make sure that there is traceability to the source material? And how do we mix generated content with more standard web results that users expect from search? So these are all kind of topics that we're thinking a lot about. Um, next slide. So essentially, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and if you're interested in chatting about any of these topics, please reach out to su.com um, and we'll open up to questions. Hi there. Hello. Sorry, I got uh, trapped, but it's something I was late. So thank you for the talk. And there are questions in Q&A. Uh, yeah, and we share some of our links about our meetup groups and our social media platforms. You're welcome to join them. And anyone else in this? questions there's a question on spark versus ray ray is a newer system that people are using to it's another orchestration tool for data processing and model training tasks i think um i haven't used ray so i can't really comment on which is better um spark is obviously much more established and has a larger ecosystem and has a larger corpus of historical kind of um, uh, trials and failures of things doing things. Uh, and so I think that I think Ray is a little bit more suited for the kind of uh, munging of ETL and model training but I haven't used it, so I can't really say a ton about, about which is going to be, which is better. Um, yeah, there aren't really any off offerings that I know of in public clouds. There might be like something specifically from the company behind Ray for managed Ray, but as someone who's run Spark jobs, both self-managed and in a managed way, um, those kind of distributed data processing uh, driver worker type systems are not trivial to manage and tune and maintain on your own. So it's probably going to be harder to to get up and running with Ray until they have some sort of like very, very um, out of the box type uh, managed solution, unless you want to spend lots and lots of time on managing uh, data compute. Cool. And I can maybe take one of the other questions. So one of the questions from Robert was, do you guys plan on including entertainment such as music and movies on you.com? Um, example, like you music, you movies. Um, I, I, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty neat idea. So, so right now we do have what we would call like an entertainment app, but it's not as full fledged as actually streaming. Um, movies to you. The idea is that right now it functions more as kind of, you know, search over movies, shows, et cetera. And we've actually incorporated it into UChat itself. So within our conversational AI, if you look up, you know, Interstellar movie or where should I watch Interstellar, you'll see essentially an app that provides streaming options. Um, right now, it's not, I wouldn't say it's on a roadmap um, in the next six months at least, but, um, you know, ideally, like, you know, maybe, maybe one day we will look further into new music and new movies. The idea is that we also are building an open platform where a lot of people can build apps and essentially we can think a lot about, you know, how do we incorporate more folks into that system and essentially build out some of this, these other items that um, we currently haven't prioritized in the short term at least. And then the next question was, do you do, uh, from Rupa, is do you do elastic way compute slash infra provision during a search? 
which cloud infra does u.com use? Um, so this is, this, is a, this is a good question. So unfortunately, we can't really discuss too much around the specific infrastructure um, tools that we use right now. But yeah, I mean, we are, of course, um, you know, making sure that what we build is robust and scalable and essentially elastic. And I don't know, Sam, if you want to add any more details there, or we can leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, we don't provision infrastructure during a search. That would be not the most efficient thing, but I might not be understanding the question. We are very, like, we do have, like, elastic in the sense that our systems are horizontally scalable, um, given input traffic. But I don't know if that's what the question's asking. Yeah, I think that was my sense of the question. But Rupa, feel free to, you know, correct us if we're mistaken. Um, one question is, can one, I'm guessing, own their own app slash service using u.com train models in the NLP space? Build, okay, yeah. Um, so I think we've added the word build. Um, yeah, I mean, so the idea would be, so right now, we haven't really released a lot of our models via an API for other people to build. We've been pretty focused as a consumer company. Um, but that said, we are kind of always open to partnerships and we do talk to a lot of folks who want to leverage um, a lot of the APIs that we use internally. So if that's of interest to you or, or your company, um, you should definitely just reach out to us. We have our emails listed here and we can see if there's something we can potentially work on together. Um, Great, I think these are all the questions. Uh, thank you, Sam and Sai here for a great uh, meeting and speech. So cool. it's a fantastic company, actually. And it's great that you, there is a U.com available for a later stage company like this. So thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, we're going to keep uh, hosting events like that. And our meetup groups will list it again. Welcome to join if you're not a member. So thank you again, Sam uh, and Sahil, for the meeting. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.